get on with it. I um, want to, uh, first of all, recognize that uh, Kinsey's father, Monty Matthews, is in the crowd, so he came down from uh, Oregon to uh, a day, and we really appreciate that. Uh, nice to uh, get the support from people, and uh, all of her lab mates uh, have uh, done a great job of getting some food and beer for us later. So I want to uh, talk to you about uh, Kinsey and uh, how she got here. So uh, she was a scholar and an athlete in um, high school, and she uh, was the women's team captain for her high school that uh, went to the youth national championships. So uh, from there, she went on to uh, my alma mater, Oregon State University. Uh, where I'm sure she had dreams of competing in the women's four events in the Olympics. Um, and uh, fortunately for us, she didn't go that direction. She ended up getting a, a Bachelor of Science in Biology uh, with a chemistry minor, and she was an organic chemistry tutor. Wow, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> and graduated with honors uh, from OSU. She also had extensive work in the animal care facilities. I'm sure coming from her dad, who was uh, an eye cook at the University of Oregon. Um, and when she told me that she was going to uh, be uh, interested in this coming to Moss Landing, I thought, well, you know, we're not really animal husbandry types here. And then she said, I conducted uh, experiments involving cold shock treatments. I said, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I knew that she would be a good fit here. Um, after graduating from OSU, uh, she went to the Bimini Biological Field Station in the Bahamas, as a number of our previous students have, and learned how to tag lemon sharks and tiger sharks and nurse sharks with a variety of different kinds of tags. And um, I've done a lot of acoustic tagging work, so that was of interest to me when I uh, heard that. She also worked uh, with Pisco and the intertidal operations up in Oregon, and I could tell right away that she would fit in with the Ross Landing crowd because she was well prepared except for her footwear. <laughs> so, um, and then um, I first met her when she called me from the Philippines and she was working with whale sharks and uh, expressing an interest in coming to Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. So uh, she'd done a variety of work with uh, big animals and small animals. Um, so when I talked with her, she said um, that she was interested in um, marine sciences because of an early ecology course she took. And she was particularly interested in the connections of uh, species and how spatial ecology could be used for management purposes, which is some of the things that we do in, in our lab. And she said, my uh, internship, internships showed me that a strong work ethic, persistence, and attention to detail were all essential components <coughs> of a good researcher. And that's certainly what we kind of preach in our lab, is uh, that uh, rounded part of being having a good work ethic, persistence, and, uh, and uh, attention to detail. So, you know, I've always told people, you don't have to be the smartest one around the block, but if you work hardest, you're going to be great. And then if you're both smart and you work hard, you're going to be stellar. And uh, that's what Kinsey is. So um, she arrived in the summer of 2019. And these are all the uh, projects that she's involved in. Certainly, she went out on our CCFRP surveys and uh, extracted gonads and uh, otoliths for fish. She um, compiled, organized, and analyzed logbooks uh, for, for the Department of Fish and Wildlife with a grant we have to assess bycatch in the California halibut fishery. 
she uh, deployed and recovered uh, rugs, um, both working for Scott's uh, project in the surf zone and uh, working with our mini lander projects with James Lindholm, um, down from, up from CSRB. Uh, she spent a number of uh, weeks at sea with us um, on uh, larger boats to deploy, learn how to deploy and use our uh, boss video landers. And then, of course, because she did that, she spent hours and hours and hours in the video lab reviewing uh, video and identifying fishes. And then, on top of all that, uh, she uh, learned uh, a lot of statistical analyses and uh, became proficient with R uh, later on in her career here. And um, as for fun, uh, she assisted uh, with aerial surveys to uh, looking for leatherback turtles and, and whales. So uh, I don't know when she had a chance to sleep because uh, she was always on the go. And uh, at, because of that, she's earned a lot of honors and awards. A Martin Scholarship, a number of CSU um, grants, ML, ML Wave Awards, and she was president of the Moss Hunting Student Body uh, in 2020, 2021. Um, and she's made a number of different presentations and uh, written a couple of different publications while she was here. And it's really impressive to me that uh, she's been able to do that, given that we had COVID plop down in the very beginning of her tenure here. Uh, she came to me and, and we had a wonderful time for the first year thinking of all kinds of really cool field projects where we would tag fish and track their movements and and then COVID arrived and all of that went out the, the window. Uh, so I was really impressed that uh, Kinsey was able to adapt to that and come up with ideas for a really strong thesis that she could do uh, by herself basically without encountering COVID uh, laden lab meets. So, you know, given all that, I, I'm just really impressed with her. And I realized, I thought to myself, what does she have that I don't? <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, she's got a lot of uh, great characteristics. First of all, she's organized <laughs> and always prepared. Every time uh, you look around, she's making a list and, and gathering things up for uh, the uh, field work. She's really focused and she can concentrate. And here she is focusing on catching some flying fish with a net. So um, that's a, an impressive uh, characteristic she has. She's always ready to jump into work. Anytime you ask her to do something, she's ready to do it. And she's amazingly comfortable at sea. She works at sea really well. Um, also, she's comfortable in the water, and you know, as you can expect, <laughs> is always working when she's in the water. Importantly, uh, as she said uh, in her words about paying attention to detail, she's always alert and ready to go <laughs> whenever we're working at sea. Um, and uh, she's hardy. She can endure the harsh conditions we sometimes see in the sea around. So um, I'm impressed with those characteristics. In addition to that, uh, she's really flexible. <laughs> <laughs> so as she said, she tried to uh, come up with a, a thesis idea every month as things were changing with COVID. And above all, uh, she's always ready for new challenges. And uh, some of you may not know, she's an uh, adept climber and has uh, done a lot of work uh, with climbing harnesses. So uh, without further ado, I want to uh, give you Kinsey Matthews, and she's going to talk to you about improving species distribution models uh, off California.
Perfect. Well, thank you, Rick, for that wonderful introduction. Um, some of those photos I wish no one else could have seen, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll roll with it. So thank you, everyone, for being here today in person or via Zoom to watch me defend my master's thesis titled Improving Species Distribution Models of Continental Shell Fishes Off California. So first off, I just wanted to go over a quick outline of my talk today. So I'm gonna start with a background, get into my objectives and hypotheses, my methods, results, and finally a discussion about what it all means. And if you ever find yourself lost today during the talk, there'll be a banner at the top that will let you know which section we're in. So first off, we're gonna go over some background knowledge and information about the topic, specifically what species habitat associations and what species distribution models are. Um, and why we want to know about them. So at a higher level, scientists and resource managers are continuously trying to protect fish biodiversity and to create sustainable fisheries of federally and state managed fish stocks. To effectively do this, we require knowledge of the distribution and habitat use of fish species. And off the US West Coast, several government agencies are working towards identifying something called essential fish habitats, which are the habitats that are critical to the survival or reproduction of marine fishes. And once we know what these habitats are, we can more effectively protect them. So to understand, understand essential fish habitat, we need to know how fish are interacting, using, and associating with habitats, also known as species habitat associations. Species habitat associations are less known in the marine world, particularly for demersal species that are found at deeper depths, as they are difficult and expensive to study. Additionally, many species exhibit ontogenetic shifts in which their habitat changes during development. So for example, ling cod move to rockier habitats as they grow older. So these attributes make it harder to define species habitat associations, but if scientists and resource managers can successfully understand these associations and how they vary temporally or spatially, we can better predict where these species might be and which habitats that they're utilizing. So previous studies that have looked at species habitat associations have utilized a wide variety of methods ranging from bottom trawls to scuba surveys. Those that include video surveys can provide more information about species and the type of habitats that they occupy. Each method can be an effective way to obtain in situ observations about the type of habitats that species occupy. For example, based on these surveys, we know that benthic habitat features such as the type of substrate are known important predictors in the distribution, relative abundance, and diversity of fishes. So for example, basic species habitat associations are known for many California fishes, such as demersal rock fishes, which are often associated with rocky habitats, or for flatfishes and ratfishes, which are more often associated with that soft bottom habitat. However, we found that while we can obtain these in situ observations of the habitat using these methods, we need more information besides in situ observations before we can make accurate quantitative predictions about the distribution of species. And we know this because when we go out and survey geographically close and seemingly similar habitats and rocky reefs, exhibit differences in the abundance and diversity of fishes. It seems like not all rock is created equal, and there's kind of a push in the scientific world to understand what features besides the seafloor lithology are contributing to these differences. So instead of in situ observations, habitat characteristics can also be derived from remote sensing tools. So remote sensing tools such as side scan sonar and multi-beam echo sounders allow for accurate depictions of the and the seafloor maps created by multi-beam echo sounders are called digital elevation models, or DEMs, which can be created at different spatial resolutions. They can then be imported into, into the geographic information system, GIS software, where both broad scale and fine scale habitat metrics can be calculated. So fishes can be associated with both broad scale and fine scale habitats. So broad scale habitats, Habitats include features such as submarine canyons, seamounts, plateaus, reefs, or habitat patches. 
while fine scale habitats focus more on the seafloor substrate and the complexity of the substrate that can be defined via topographic metrics. So these topographic metrics are derived from, that, from those digital elevation models and GIS software and can be used to help describe the complexity of the seafloor. And several studies off of California have looked at fish's associations with these topographic metrics. And, today, and so today I'm just going to go over a few important ones that have been utilized off California. So first off, we have rugosity or vector ruggedness measure, VRM, which is basically how wrinkled the surface is. So VRM was positively correlated with species richness. Slope, or the steepness of the seafloor, was correlated with higher densities of benthic fishes. Curvature, or the rate of change of the seafloor, was a significant predictor that determined the distribution of gopher rockfish, kelp rockfish, and olive rockfish. Aspect, or the compass direction that a, that a slope faces, helped determine the distribution of yellowtail rockfish and rosy rockfish. Next, we have topographic position index, or TPI, which basically measures the, ele the elevation at one point compared to its surrounding points. And this can be done at multiple scales to look at broad scale and fine scale habitat features. So for example, a positive broad scale TPI could represent something like a seamount, while a positive fine scale TPI could represent something like a small pinnacle. So off California, Green striped rockfish were more often associated with broad scale TPIs, suggesting the species was associated with broad scale habitats, um, while yellow, yellowtail rockfish was more often associated with a fine scale TPI, suggesting that species was closely associated with fine scale habitats. So the relationships between fishes and their habitats can be used in something called species distribution models, or SDMs. SDMs combine species observations with environmental variables such as bathymetry, sea surface temperature, or those topographic metrics to predict the occurrence and distribution of species. And basically how this works is known species observations, either presence or absence data or abundance data, are overlaid onto geographic maps containing topographic or oceanographic characteristics to determine distribution patterns through the use of different modeling techniques. These patterns can then be extrapolated to unsurveyed regions to predict species occurrences or community assemblages. And there are a bunch of different potential SDM applications, and so just a few of them uh, that I'll go over today. So one, we can more effectively target new field surveys or improve our survey designs. We can also use these models for conservation initiatives, such as identifying suitable locations for marine protected areas. We can use SDMs to forecast the effects of climate change on fish distributions. And these models can also be used to understand fish population size and community assemblages in unsurveyed regions, which could be incorporated into stock assessments. So SDMs have been utilized around the world on a variety of different taxa. And in general, these SDMs have been at a relatively large scale, such as the figure on the right, which, show, which shows the probability of occurrence of a species over a huge area. And these wide scale models generally use environmental variables such as bathymetry, sea surface, temp sea surface temperature, or say chlorophyll, um, to basically describe the basic um, habitat areas where a species might occur. So in California, these models are trying to go past those broad scale distributions to a fine scale level to be more useful for management. So within the general distribution where we know the species occurs, what are the fine scale differences that dictate where a species might be on a rocky reef feature? And off of California, the SDMs to model fish distributions have created these models generally using one year of data, using traditional modeling techniques like generalized linear models and general, generalized additive models. They've also mainly used those basic topographic metrics that I mentioned earlier, along with a few others. And they have reported high levels of accuracy. However, those accuracy measurements are actually derived from the same data set and are not representative of the true accuracy. 
And so what I mean by that is these models were created from 80% of the data and tested on 20%, which is more of a measure of precision. How well is your testing data fitting your training data rather than the overall accuracy? And additionally, if you just test and train your data on the same data set, you're at risk of overfitting your model. So to obtain a true accuracy measurement that is more representative of your model's performance, it's important to test your model on um, say an independent year or a whole other separate region. And we've actually seen this occur. So when these models are later tested with subsequent field sampling, they exhibit poor predictability and poor accuracy. So further research is needed to understand why these models have poor predictive abilities and if we can improve these models to be more useful for management. And so that takes me into the goals and objectives of my thesis. So the overall goals of my thesis were to increase the predictive capabilities of presence and absence marine species distribution models off California and to expand our knowledge of fish habitat associations with topographic metrics. So that second goal is kind of the chapter one of my thesis where I really look at what those species habitat associations are for different species and how they vary across the coast. I conducted a variety of different analyses for that. I looked at frequency distributions, logistic regressions, and basic modeling techniques. Um, but today I'm just gonna focus on that second part. So if you're interested in this, feel free to read my thesis. Um, so today I'll be talking about how we can actually improve those models using a variety of techniques that I'll get into my objectives. So my first objective was to determine if seascape characteristics, such as the habitat patch size, habitat complexity, and proximity to ecotones increases the accuracy of SDMs. And I wanted to specifically explore this objective because we know from landscape ecology that there are these long-held paradigms relating habitat patches to the diversity or abundance of fishes. So for example, greater species diversity is often found in larger habitat patches and habitat patches of greater complexity and in proximity to the ecotone, which is the junction between two different habitat types. However, these patterns are less known and more nuanced in the marine world, particularly in deeper environments. And so I hypothesize that these metrics will improve the accuracy of SDMs. My second objective was to determine how SDMs change with different DEM resolutions, specifically two meter, five meter, and 10 meter. And I hypothesize that finer resolution DEMs will exhibit higher model accuracy than lower resolution DEMs. My third objective was to determine if the accuracy of SDMs increases with more years of data. And I hypothesize that the accuracy will increase with more years of data until it will eventually plateau. My fourth objective was to determine if machine learning methods outperform traditional SDMs that are derived from GLMs or GAMs. And I hypothesize that machine learning methods such as random forest and boosted regression trees will be more accurate and predictive than GLMs or GAMs. And I basically think this because random forest and boosted regression trees are hyper-tuned models that take a subsample of your data to create decision trees and come up with a prediction. This is done hundreds or thousands of times until a final prediction is reached. And with the case of boosted regression trees, the model actually learns from previous iterations. Therefore, you know, I hypothesize that these more sophisticated models will outperform more, more classical linear regression models. My fifth objective was to create coastwide species specific SDMs using the results from earlier and to test at Point Lobos, which would be an independent location. Additionally, to really examine the spatial extent to which these models can be extrapolated, I wanted to create models at Point Sur and extrapolate them to Point Lobos and Big Creek. And I hypothesize that the final coastwide model will accurately predict species occurrences at Point Lobos, and that the models created at Point Sur will more accurately predict species occurrences at Point Lobos and Big Creek than the coastwide model. All right, so now getting into the methods. So in general, I had three regions that I looked at, northern, central, and southern. And for, day, and for today, for my objectives, my northern site was Bodega Bay, my central site was Point Sur, 
in my southern site was um, Harris Point, and my test sites that are on the figure in green were Point Lobos and Big Creek. All the data was collected from 2005 and to 2019 over a wide variety of depths. My study species were blue rockfish, gopher rockfish, sling cod, and vermilion rockfish. And I chose these species as they all exhibit slight differences in life history traits and characteristics. So blue rockfish are a semi-pelagic schooling species. Gopher rockfish are a benthic territorial species. Ling cod exhibit those ontogenetic shifts that I mentioned earlier, while vermilion rockfish are benthic and often seen alone or in small groups. So to obtain all of my species presences that I used in my model, I used data that was collected from a long-term remotely operated vehicle or ROV data set that was operated by, the, by MARE or the Marine Applied Research and Exploration Group. So they surveyed along the entire California coastline and, and conducted 500 meter long transects. They flew the ROV at a speed of 0.25 to 0.5 meters per second and it was also equipped with an underwater video system that had two forward-mounted cameras. So Mari personnel actually analyzed the video, and they counted and identified each fish to the lowest taxonomic level, and positional information, so like a GPS coordinate, was applied to each fish. And actually, uh, prior to this becoming my thesis, myself and a few others in the lab went through old Mari video to uh, get length estimates for fishes. So I actually have a few videos that I had saved on my computer that I thought I would share today, just so you can kind of see what the ROVs look like. So this video on the left, we have this super cool wolf eel, we had a gopher rockfish, California sheephead, and finally some little um, juvenile vermilion rockfish in the lower right corner. And then also had a couple of videos that had some giant octopuses, so that was really cool to see and the ROV kind of like followed them for as long as they could. All right, so next I had to actually create my species presence and absence points that I would use in my model. So first I plotted my species presences, which is the figure on the right. So my blue rockfish, gopher rockfish, ling cod, and vermilion. Next I had to create my species absence points that would be found along the transect. And rather than just having the start and the end GPS coordinates for the transect, I also plotted every fish that was seen along that transect so I could get a more accurate depiction of the ROV line. As, as you can see, it often wasn't straight and it kind of wriggled around. So then I created uh, potential absence points every 10 meters along the transect line. And I also created a buffer around each uh, species presence point before I chose my absence points to account, to account for spatial autocorrelation. So spatial autocorrelation is a concept that objects closer to one another will be more similar than objects further apart. And this is an important concept when creating species distribution models as you could have a number of false absences if you do not take spatial autocorrelation into account. So for example, say there is a gopher rockfish at point A, that would be considered one of our species presence points. And at five meters away, there's another gopher rockfish, but he's just kind of hiding out of sight. So the habitat from point A to point B is more likely to be similar than say habitat that's 200 meters away. So that would be considered spatial autocorrelation. And if I were to put B as a potential um, absence point, that could be considered a false absence, as the habitat is very similar, and there's actually gopher rockfish there, he's just hiding out of sight. Um, so therefore, the buffer that I created around each fish presence point helps to account for spatial autocorrelation and minimizes the number of false absences that we might have in our models. So I then deleted any absence points within that species-specific buffer. And then I randomly sampled to have the same number of absence points as presence points. So now that I had the presence and absence points for my models, I needed the actual variables that I would use. So uh, I created my habitat characteristics and I got bathymetric data from the NOAA National Centers of Environmental Information and the California, California Undersea Imagery Archive Lab at CSUMB. I created raster layers of VRM, slope, TPI, curvature, aspect, broken down into northness and eastness, 
distance to shelf edge and distance to shoreline. I then extracted all of those habitat values and applied them to each fish presence and absence point. So now that I had my species presence and absences and all of my habitat characteristics, I could actually create my models. So I created GLMs and went through the necessary model creation steps. So I first assessed multicollinearity via the variation inflation factor, or VIF, in Pearson's correlation. I made sure all VIF scores were less than four and Pearson's correlation was 0.6, which is below the acceptable level for these scores. I then used Ikaikai's information criterion, or AIC, to help decide what that best model would be. And if I had any two models that were within two AIC scores of one another, I further assessed them using pseudo R squared values. Once I had my final model for that species in that region, I created 10 different GLMs with different test and training data sets, and I evaluated them using the area under the receiving operating curve, or AUC, accuracy, and Cohen's kappa. So that kind of created my baseline models, and now I wanted to improve them using all of those objectives that I mentioned earlier. So I created my new models and compared them to the original models. I used the same habitat variables and DEM resolutions, unless otherwise mentioned, and I used ANOVAs and post hoc tests to compare AUC, accuracy, and Cohen's kappa between the original and the new models. And for the purposes of today, I'm just going to share the results of the accuracy uh, value. So really quick, accuracy is calculated from something called a confusion matrix, um, which evaluates the performance of a classification model by summarizing the number of correct and incorrect predictions. So accuracy values can basically be interpreted as a percentage of correctly identified species absences or presences. All right, so now getting into the actual results. So for that first objective where I included seascape variables, I chose to look at each one of my study species, and I conducted the analyses at Point Sur because there were obvious delineations in habitat patches. So I used a two meter DEM composed of soft and hard substrate, which I then converted into habitat patches, which is the figure that you see on the right there. So I ended up creating 99 different habitat patches that ranged in value from the area to the complexity. I then extracted each area, each habitat patch area, habitat complexity, and distance to ecotone to each fish presence or absence point that was located within a habitat patch. I then compared the accuracy among three different model types. So the first model was the topographic only model using those topographic metrics that I mentioned earlier, like curvature, VRM, slope, et cetera. I then had a topographic and seascape models. So those included the topographic metrics and the habitat patch area, complexity, and distance to ecotone. And finally, I had my seascape only model. So those models were only created from those seascape variables of habitat patch area, complexity, and distance to ecotone. So for this figure that we see up, on the x-axis, we have the type of model, so the topographic only, topographic and seascape, and seascape only. We have our accuracy on the y-axis, and then it's broken down for the different fish species. So starting off with blue rockfish, the ANOVA was significant, and specifically, the seascape only model performed the worst, while there was no difference between the topographic only model and the topographic and seascape models. Next up, we have gopher rockfish and lingcod that exhibited similar trends. So again, the ANOVA was significant, and the topographic models performed better than the topographic and seascape models, which performed better than the seascape-only models. And finally, we have vermilion rockfish. So again, the ANOVA was significant, and the topographic-only model performed better than the seascape-only model. So next up, I looked at different DEM resolutions, and I chose to look at gopher rockfish and lean cod as they exhibit differences in their movement patterns and home ranges, and could therefore be used as proxies for other species. I conducted the analyses at Bodega Bay, as I had a multitude of different DEMs available to me to use. So for this figure, on the x-axis, we have DEM resolution, so our two meter, five meter, and 10 meter. And on the y-axis, we have accuracy. 
And as you can see, there was no difference between DEM resolutions and accuracy for either gopher rockfish or ling cod. So next, I looked at my incremental years of data. I chose to look at each one of my study species, and I conducted the analyses at Harris Point as it was the most complete uh, data set for each species. So each species either had seven or eight years of data available. And for this, I left one year out to test for model performance. So for this figure on the y-axis, we have the years of data going from one to seven or one to six if you're blue rockfish. And then again, we have accuracy on the y-axis. So I ended up creating 63 distinct GLMs for blue rockfish and 127 distinct GLMs for gopher rockfish, lingcod, and vermilion. And I then averaged that so we can look at the overall trends. So the ANOVA, a two-way ANOVA was significant for test year and the years of data. Specifically, one year of data performed worse than more years of data. And in general, you can see that with more years of data, accuracy kind of increases until it kind of does plateau. Uh, you can also see that for one of these species, go for rockfish, the pattern doesn't quite look like the others. So around six years of data, accuracy decreases, and at seven, it sharply increases. And if you actually take a look back at the figure on the left, you can see that there are these two years in gopher rockfish where the pattern doesn't quite match the others. So that would be for the year 2005 and 2007. So the accuracy kind of goes up, goes back down, and goes back up. And I looked at this further and found that those two test years have a really low sample size. So I want to say there is less than 30 individuals. And so because of that, there was a greater probability of misclassifying the species absences and presences, which is kind of what led to this almost randomness within those test years. Um, so that's kind of what's driving the pattern that we see for gopher rockfish. So next, for the different modeling methods and to determine if that, um, if machine learning methods increased model performance, I conducted the analyses at Harris Point again, as it was the most complete data set, and I looked at each one of my study species. I created GLMs, GAMs, random forest, and boosted regression trees, and kept each year out once to use as an independent year for model evaluation. And I just wanted to note that due to the differences between random forests and boosted regression trees compared to GLMs and GAMs, I was able to re-include all of those variables. Um, so, and that's because for boosted regression tree and random forest, multicollinearity is less of an issue. I also utilized something called K-fold cross-validation, and I made sure to hyper-tune all of my models. So for this figure, on the x-axis, we have our model type, ranging from GLMs, GAMs, to our machine learning methods of random forest and boosted regression tree. Again, we have accuracy in the y-axis. So starting off with blue rockfish, the ANOVA was not significant, so there's no difference among the different modeling techniques. Next up, we have gopher rockfish, where the ANOVA was significant. So the random forest models performed better than the GAMs and GLMs, while boosted regression tree models only outperformed GLMs. Next, we have LINCOD, where again, the ANOVA was not significant, so no difference among modeling techniques. And lastly, we have vermilion rockfish, where the ANOVA was significant, and boosted regression trees and random forests both outperformed GLMs and GAMs. And so this pattern that we see with gopher rockfish and vermilion rockfish, where these machine learning methods are kind of outperforming the GLMs and GAMs, I wanted to see if these patterns held true at another location where there are fewer years of data. And so with gopher rockfish and vermilion rockfish, I conducted more analyses at Bodega Bay where there are fewer years of data available. And so this is the same graph that we saw earlier. So for gopher rockfish, the ANOVA was now not significant, so there's now no difference among the different modeling methods. While for vermilion rockfish, it was significant, and specifically, just GAMs outperformed boosted regression trees in accuracy. Additionally, you can see that GAMs exhibit a super low variance compared to the other modeling methods. All right, so now I wanted to actually create my coastwide model. So I created this from all locations. I used all years of data. I used 10 meter DEM resolutions. I also did not use those seascape variables. And I um, used random forest as the modeling technique. 
I then extrapolated them to Point Lobos. And out of those four coastwide models, it was actually only successful for Lincoln. So I had an overall 80% accuracy. And that figure on the right is kind of a visual representation of these species distribution models. So we have our Lincoln presences, those are those white dots. Our Lincoln absences are those black dots. And then we have our predicted species presences and absences. And as you can see, where there were actual absences of Lincoln, those black dots, that correlates to where the predicted absences are. So that's just kind of a visual representation of these models. Next, to look at the um, ability to which we can extrapolate these models, I created the models at Point Sur, and I extrapolated them to Point Lobos and Big Creek. Again, I used random forest, 10 meter DEM resolution, and I just used the topographic variables, no seascape variables. So out of my eight models, two were considered successful. So the first was for gopher rockfish at Big Creek, had a 81% accuracy, and I also wanted to mention that the AUC and Cohen's kappa values were uh, 0.81 and 0.64, and all of those values would be considered successful for this type of model. The second model was for Lincoln, again at Point Lobos. The accuracy actually decreased from the coastwide model of 80% to 75%. And again, the AUC and Cohen's kappa would be considered successful. All right, so now into an actual discussion about what it all means. So I found that the inclusion of seascape variables either decreased model performance or resulted in no significant difference. So this might mean that these seascape variables are not important in predicting uh, where fish might be, but I think it's important to note that my study was not really designed to explicitly answer those questions. So I had unequal effort in habitat patches, and my habitat patches were created after the fact. Um, so I do believe that, that another study with equal effort within distinct habitat patches would result in a more definitive answer to some of these seascape-related questions. I also found that there was no significant difference in model performance among habitat variables that were derived from 2 meter, 5 meter, or 10 meter DEMs. This is honestly encouraging for researchers as 10 meter DEMs are readily available across the California coastline. Um, however, this is interesting because Ann Tijini, a previous Moss Landing student, um, found, well, she used SDMs to predict biomass at different DEM resolutions, and she found widely different results. Um, and I think there could be several discrepancies between, you know, the differences that she found and the fact that I didn't find differences between these different DEM resolutions. Um, so first, we just used different methods. So she extrapolated her biomass to each DEM cell within a region, while I just used the models to predict species occurrences at known sites. Um, secondly, abundance models might be more uh, sensitive to biotic data, just, such as intra or inter-species um, interactions which could affect the predictive ability of abundance models more than simple occurrence models. Overall, I found that performance increased with more years of data, and I actually ran a few more models, and I found that more years of data with fewer observations outperformed one or two years of data with a lot of observations. And this could be because multiple years of data might account for differences in habitat usage due to yearly fluctuations in environmental variables. Additionally, I found that model performance did fluctuate depending on which year was used as the independent test year. So those with few observations uh, just performed poorly. And I believe this highlights the importance of creating and for testing your model on an adequate sample size. In general, I found that at Harris Point, either there is no difference or random forest and boosted regression trees outperformed GLMs or GAMs. However, at Bodega Bay, GAMs exhibited a much lower variance than any other modeling method and actually outperformed boosted regression trees. So I think this highlights the importance that different modeling te techniques might work better to different species at different locations. So it's important to test a variety of modeling methods when you're creating these species distribution models. Another important result of my study was that overall these models could not really be extrapolated to unsurveyed regions. So models that couldn't be extrapolated 
even 20 or 30 kilometers away really points towards regional differences in how species interact and associate with their environments. Additionally, uh, the habitat at Point Lobos and Point Sur were quite different from one another, and perhaps these models might only be able to be extrapolated to similar um, habitat types. And so these results are actually fairly similar to another study that's been conducted here off of California. So different models were created at Cornell Bank, which is located off Point Reyes. And then they extrapolated those models to the Del Monte shale beds located off of Monterey. And they did this for yellowtail rockfish and rosy rockfish. So this is, a, is an example of the yellowtail rockfish. So it was created at Cordell Bank and was able to be successfully extrapolated to the Del Monte shale beds. I believe there's an overall accuracy of around 70%. However, they did find that for rosy rockfish, these models were unable to be extrapolated. So the entire area of the Del Monte shale beds was predicted to have a high probability of occurrence for rosy rockfish, which the authors believed um, was kind of not a real result, and so they were, weird. they were a little suspicious of it. And the authors also hypothesized that it didn't work for rosy rockfish due to a lack of overlap among certain habitat variables. So the results of my study do have important implications when it comes to management. Um, first, these models are just presence and absence models. They are not abundance models. And due to their inability to be accurately extrapolated, I would be wary of any abundance models that are trying to use these for uh, stock assessment reasons. And again, there are probably even greater variables at play that determine the abundance of a species rather than just the occurrence of it. And while precise locations of where a fish might be is not quite attainable yet, these models can still be useful for management or scientific purposes. Uh, so first, they can be used to determine essential fish habitat and potentially locate new locations for marine protected areas. Furthermore, within a particular area, these models could be used to direct sampling and plan field surveys. Um, for example, say Scott and others are trying to catch gopher rockfish out in the bay, or sorry, instead of gopher, I meant copper rockfish out in the bay, which, well, I, I heard at first you were trying to go for copper and you were unable to find them. So, lots of, sorry, lots of surveys have been conducted in Monterey, so they could use those past models, or sorry, those past surveys to create these species, these species distribution models to basically find where the high probability of occurrence of copper rockfish might be. And then when they actually go out and sample, they can prioritize those areas. Additionally, the results from my thesis could be used to inform other SDM studies off California. So you know, researchers could use some of my results of looking at different modeling methods and trying to include multiple years of data before they create their own models. It is important to remember that these topographic metrics just identify what habitat might be suitable for these species and often acts as proxies for more biologically relevant data. So there are many more factors at play that affect the determine or that determine the distribution of marine fishes, such as temperature, underwater currents, food availability, predation and competition, and fishing pressure. Some of these variables are obviously harder to quantify than others. However, their use in models, if applicable would greatly increase their model performance and the accuracy of them. All right, and with that, I'm gonna go through my acknowledgements. Uh, so my thesis committee, I'm gonna talk a bit more about you later. Um, but first, uh, Mari personnel, thank you so much for letting me use all of these data. Um, I wouldn't have been able to answer the questions that I did if I didn't have this long-term ROV data set available. So, Thank you so much. Um, Carrie Bretz from the California Undersea Emerging Archive Lab. She, she gave me a lot of my different DM resolutions that I looked at. Uh, Duke University created the Marine Geo Geospatial Ecology Toolbox, or MGET, which I used in some of my earlier analyses. Uh, MLML staff and community, I've loved being a student here at Moss Landing and getting to interact with all of you and interact with Marine Ops and the shop guys while working with Rick um, on our projects. The Fisheries Lab, past and present, others who have helped, Pat from CSUMB, when I was early in these stages, you know, thinking of my ROV lines and how to create my absence points, and if I was doing anything correctly, um, it was great to talk with him 
and he was able to give me a couple tips and just to talk with things through him. Uh, Chris, who's down at uh, Santa Barbara, I spoke with him a lot about rainforest and boosted regression tree models, again, because I honestly didn't really know what I was doing, so it was great to talk with someone who knows what they're doing and able to just, you know, pat me on the back and say, you're doing it right, you're doing a good job. Um, Larry Allen, he created all those wonderful fish drawings that you saw throughout my presentation, so thank you for letting me use them. Uh, the various funding that I have received, the CSU Coast Graduate Student Research Award, the Zipia Scholarship, and the Moss Landing Marine Labs Wave, Wave Awards. To my thesis committee, uh, Rick, thank you for accepting me into your lab. Looking back, I realized I've totally grown as a scientist while I've been here. Um, I was able to be on a boat, I think, like 100 days at sea in a year, which is pretty incredible. So I've just received a bunch of field experience along with you know, learning how to use R and conducting all these statistical analyses. Um, and I also realized prior to grad school, I would kind of read a scientific paper and just say, oh yeah, that must be true. And now I've realized to, re to really like read it critically and to poke holes into whatever that is that I'm reading. Um, so thank you for that. Um, to the rest of my committee, Scott, Amanda, and James, thank you for all of your insightful feedback and support on my thesis. Um, Scott, thank you for always encouraging me to dig deeper um, into my results and to ask additional questions. That's definitely strengthened my thesis. Um, Amanda, thank you for your support and encouragement throughout my whole time at Moss Landing. You know, I hope to never paint a snail again, but uh, population biology was one of my favorite courses here, so thank you. Um, James, thank you for, you know, you know a lot about Species Habitat Association, so it was great to talk with you and to hear your knowledge and expertise. And again, always kind of encouraging me and reminding me to really put my thesis in a broader context. Next to all of the friends I've made at Moss Landing, um, just thank you all so much for your support. The fisheries lab, I swear we have to be the most dysfunctional lab at Moss Landing, but I wouldn't have it any other way. There's nothing quite like spending three weeks together at sea that will really <laughs> get to know one another. Um, and thank you to everyone else in my cohort and beyond who I've met um, while here in Monterey. To my other friends who are scattered throughout the world, I'm so sorry I'm terrible at responding to your text messages, but I know you will always be there for me no matter what. It's great to vent, to talk, to talk with you, or to just laugh at a funny meme. Um, to my boyfriend, Kevin, thank you for being in my life and going on so many adventures with me throughout my time in graduate school. I'm so thankful to have you and your family in my life. Um, to my parents, my dad who's here today, my mom who's watching via Zoom, and my other family members via Zoom. Um, thank you for always encouraging me to pursue my passion wherever it may lead me to the Bahamas or Southeast Asia or graduate school. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm so thankful for all your love and support. And with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs> Too. <laughs> I would be totally okay with that. <laughs> yeah, um, so you said that you saw no differences between two, five, and ten meter resolutions for your mm -hmm. DEM models. Do you think, therefore, it would be viable to extrapolate even to a coarser resolution, like thirty meter resolution, or do you think that would be unviable? I think you could definitely do that. That was a question that kind of my committee members had for me. You know, so there's no difference between 2, 5, and 10. What about 20? Um, I do think maybe there wouldn't be a difference between 20 and 10. I think it kind of depends on your survey design in the first place. Um, but I definitely think there's greater opportunity and possibility to look even beyond 2, 5, and 10 to those greater regions. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that's definitely a potential for the future to look at. Karen. Yeah, nice, really nice job. Great, great thesis, great questions. Um, it's really cool, you know, as you know, I do cetacean species distribution modeling, for those of you who don't, with a wide variety of different species and, and um, ecological connections. And 
it's nice to see that you're finding some of the same things that we're finding in terms mm -hmm. of general patterns about model and species and approaches. Um, and I won't bore everyone with details. But there were a few differences, and in particular, um, we have found, uh, I'm curious about your performance of the BRTs and random forest versus the Gans and Glens, which really were two separate families of, of models. Mm -hmm. um, whether you had any specific species characteristics that were associated with the ones for which the, the you know, tree-based methods versus the regression-based methods worked. And mm -hmm. the reason I'm asking, and, and maybe this will help you understand what I'm really asking, um, in the afternoon, my brain is shutting down. Uh, we found that the species that had a low prevalence, so that were in, in a more restricted type of habitat, that the regression trees sometimes basically, I always, I always called it, barked up the wrong tree, and that they had poorer performance because they would kind of fit to something that was peculiar about the specific limited habitats that the species were in, and then we tried to extrapolate that a new habitat or a new year, it would perform poorly. Mm -hmm. Not being a fish person, forgive me for any job. <laughs> um, is there any such pattern with the species for which you found the, the gams and glims did better versus the regression trees? Mm -hmm. um, you may not know the answer, but I'm just curious whether there was something similar. Yeah, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. So with gopher rockfish and vermilion rockfish, the boosted regression trees and rainforest did better than the GLMs and, and GAMs. And for the other ones, there was no significant difference. Uh, blue rockfish, where there was no difference, that's definitely a schooling species, which I do believe probably obviously behaves different from these other fishes. And I also think maybe like species occurrences isn't the best just type in general, like maybe abundance models are better for that species. Yeah. Um, and then for lingcod, where it wasn't significant, they do exhibit those ontogenetic shifts, and they might have a larger home range than vermilion rockfish and gopher rockfish. So, but otherwise, I can't really think of why it would be that it worked for gopher rockfish and vermilion and not wing cod. Are the gopher and vermilion in broader habitat types? That would be the um, If anything, I feel like wing cod might be in broader okay. habitat types. So, Interesting. yeah, a little bit of a different So I know you watch a lot of video, and you watch a lot of video from a variety of different platforms, right? Mm -hmm. So to the, the species that you look at all have different associations with interactions with the seafloor, and there can be some interaction with the tool too, right? So I wonder if you've thought about whether the, there's a, where the interaction between the tool that's capturing the imagery, their behavior of the organism, and, their, and the ultimate assessment of what they're associated with. See what I'm asking? What's a, what's a gopher going to do when an ROV flies over? Yeah. Relative to what it does when the boss sits there for a little while and watches it. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think fish could interact and, um, what word am I, not really, but I think they can have differences in how they react to different uh, survey tools. So I'm trying to think on the boss, I don't, I haven't really seen many gopher rockfish, if I'm being honest. Um, but on the ROV, I showed a video that had a gopher rockfish and it didn't like run away or do anything like that. But I definitely think different modeling or different survey types could have a different, um, or d fish could react differently to different survey tools. Uh, so I definitely think that's a possibility and that's kind of a question that, that I had was, all right, if I don't use ROV data, say if I used the BOSS or many lander data, how how that would change the models. And I think it could. So I think that's also, could be something that future people could do is they could create these models using ROV data and also our stationary video landers and see how they compare to one another. So I definitely think that could affect um, the species for sure. Scott. You, you mentioned that the models do better, right? And you have more years of data. Mm -hmm. So that got me thinking, I wonder if the models would do better if you did more sampling like within a year, like in the same spot after a week or something like that. Just mm -hmm. thinking about you might pick up the movements of the fish, you know, if they move a couple meters here or there. I wonder if that would improve your accuracy in terms of knowing where they might be versus where they're not mm -hmm. and just hitting it like once a year or something like that. I think that would make sense because 
because you know if you just go there once a year, you might see just where it happened to be that one time, but if you go back and you sample, you can see, all right, it likes this habitat, it also likes this habitat and that one. So I do think that would definitely improve the models for sure, if you were able to go back you know, maybe several days every other week to see kind of how daily fluctuations and environmental conditions might affect the fish's behavior. I think that could definitely improve the models. Okay. Um, well, I think we're going to leave it at that. And um, the committee's going to uh, grab Kinsey and go grill it. Ask them for some <laughs> questions. We'll be out in a couple of days. <laughs> so, uh, until we get back, uh, Les provided some food and, and uh, beverages. So, um, let's give Kinsey a big hand for.